you're, 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 you're deep into the material, so to speak. And it's meaningful. It's directly meaningful. Yes? So would this be a framework to explain why, say, novel music or stories or like an engrossing video game even would induce that kind of stress? Yeah, it's like, sure. It's you know it's another world, so you're safe, but also it's like an unfolding experience. It's game. both of those at the same time, because yeah. it's, it's, you don't want to play a video game where there are no rules. Yeah. And you don't want to play a video game where the rules transform so rapidly and erratically that there's no way you can model them. You want to play a video game where you can suspend disbelief. You know, there's some play with the axioms, so maybe there's some things about the model of reality that aren't exactly like real reality, but once that framework is established, once the rule-governed framework is established, there's play inside of it, and that's very engrossing. And I think part of the reason it's engrossing is, one, you actually learn things from playing games, because in some sense you're always playing a game, right? Because you're always inside a reality that's bounded by a certain set of assumptions, and it's not the total reality. It's like a game-like representation of the total reality, and, you know, hopefully it's a good enough game-like representation. You know, one of the things I was thinking about in relationship to video games was, you know, I've read critiques of video games where people complain about young people generally being engaged in video games, to the expense of having a real life. And then I was thinking, I don't know if you know about Edward, I think his name is Ed, Edward Castronova. Now he's an economist who studied video games, and he did this quite a while ago, I think it's got to be more than 10 years ago now, but he made the claim at that point that one of the big massive online player games, um, I think it was World of Warcraft, but that might be wrong, was like the 20th largest economy in the world. Really, not in any fake way, partly because you could sell artifacts that you were producing on eBay, for example, but also partly because people traded within it, and like there was no reason to assume that the, the additional level of abstraction that that video game represented was necessarily any more abstract than what we were already doing in economies. Mm -hmm. So then you could ask yourself, for example, think about this. Is it more real to lead a band of adventurers through a complex mythological reality in an online game or to work at McDonald's? Now you'd say, well, well, to work at McDonald's because that's real, but let's, let's think about that for a minute. So exactly why is it real? I mean, first of all, McDonald's couldn't exist unless it was nested in a whole bunch of other things, right? So it has to be nested in um, a functional capitalist economy, and that has to be nested inside a functional political system, and then there's all sorts of other preconditions in terms of material supply and so forth that have to be in place before, you to, before you're able to work there and receive tokens for your labor. Okay, so the same thing applies to the video game. And you might say, well, how do you determine which of those is real? And I would say, well, maybe one of the ways of determining whether a game is real is to what degree do you practice a wide range of the subsets of skills that would be transferable to other games while you're playing that game? And I think you could make a case that if you're playing a very complex video game, that the activities that you're engaging in, which involve leadership and cooperation and communication and problem solving, are actually a more comprehensive subset of the skills that you would have to develop to work in the world as a complex place than what you would pick up at McDonald's. Now, you know, obviously you can argue about that, but it's not self-evident. So, and I think that's, the, that's Horace, that noticing, that's the I. It's not thinking, because it's not the framing process. It's something outside of that, it's something that's watching. And I think if you notice, you'll see, if you go through your week, you'll notice, because you have to sort of stand outside yourself and think, aha, I was really into that. I was pulled right inside it. And then you see phenomena that occur along with that, which Chipset and Haile has detailed reasonably in his, in his work on flow. You don't notice the passing of time. You're not self-conscious. And the 
activity is sustaining, you experience it as sustaining, even though it might be difficult. You know, so it's not a matter of just taking the easy way out and doing something fun. It's not that at all. Though it can be that. It's often you feel that way when you're doing something that's exceptionally challenging and difficult. And usually I think it's those things that are, they're real in relationship to your goal hierarchy. You know, so they're, they're moving you forward in the way that you've determined that moving forward is appropriate insofar as you've sorted that out. So, you know, A implies B and B implies C and C implies D and so forth. And you've sorted that all out. You know, so maybe you're working on an essay in a class that you find meaningful because you want to derive something useful from your education so that you're a good citizen, so that you can live a proper life, you know. And so the chaining of all those things makes the local activity quite richly meaningful because it's properly contextualized. But then there's the other element, which is when you're pushing yourself beyond that, not only do you experience the meaning of what you're doing in relationship to your goal hierarchy, you also transcend the goal hierarchy at the same time. So that while you're working towards realizing it, you're also working towards transforming it and improving it. All at the same time. And I think that you're set up to experience that as, as the highest form of being. And then there's a corollary to that, which is... Maybe if you spent the bulk of your time doing that, you know, so you got practiced at it, so you were doing it, well, maybe you're doing, I don't know, you, you could figure it out for yourself, but my suspicions are that for many of you, that's probably 5% of your weekly life. Maybe I'm wrong about that, because it's been a long time since I was your age. I can't remember what it was like, really, you know. But I do know, you know, when I survey undergraduates and I ask them how much time they waste, you know, they're telling me, generally speaking, it's four to six hours a day. And I actually think it's probably more than that. And so that's time not spent in this particular state of mind, you know. And it's wasted time. Well, you even recognize it as wasted time, because when someone asks you if it's wasted time, you say yes. And it's like, well, wasted, if it's wasted and you know it, you're obviously comparing that to some other sort of time that isn't wasted, right? That you regard as valuable and meaningful and, and worth engaging in, even though it might be difficult and require discipline and all those sorts of things. So you might ask yourself, you know, if you have times during the week where you're engaged enough in what you're doing so that you find that intrinsically meaningful and it removes the burden of tragedy, and I don't mean because you're preoccupied, I mean because you're experiencing what you're doing as intrinsically worth the price. That's a different thing. You might think, okay, well what if you were in that state of mind 80% of the time, or 85% of the time, or 90% of the time, you know, and that requires a tremendous amount of discipline and organization and, and clarity of purpose, and it also requires a tremendous amount of truth, because the enemy of setting yourself up so that you can do that is untruth, because what happens is, to the degree that you engage in untruth, you, you uh, contaminate your frames, fundamentally. And then you're in real trouble, because you won't be oriented properly if your frames are contaminated, and they're contaminated to the degree that you build them out of nonsense and, and delusion, 